Welcome to How to Write Good, the writing podcast that is not about how to write. My name is Daniel Poppy, your host. You can find out more about me at danielpoppy.com. If you haven't already, please follow How to Write Good on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you would like to stay up to date with both How to Write Good and everything I am working on, please sign up for my email list. You can find that at my website as well. Again, that's danielpoppy.com. All right, besides all that, check out One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet. It is a serialized story podcast, so you're going to actually have to listen to everyone to get the whole story. There are four chapters out. By this time, I think last last week, not last month, I'm very tired right now. Last week, I said that One Last Toast for Ebenezer Fleet was coming out this upcoming, like, so last week, the upcoming Sunday, I, I believe I said it was coming out then. It was actually the Sunday before. Uh, that's just a mistake I made. I just completely didn't, I don't know, I don't know what I was thinking. I just don't, I don't know when anything, when anything happens. Stuff kind of just happens. Google Calendar is phenomenal because I can keep track of what I need to keep track of. It is not a sponsor of the show, but having a calendar like that, it's very streamlined. I, I really enjoy it. I don't think Google would ever sponsor this show, honestly. Maybe they would. Who knows? I, I doubt they would, though. I don't know if they sponsor anything. Uh, I think they sell their stuff. You know, they have like uh, the Google, the Chromebooks, not Google Books. And then they have like the Google Google Glass, which what happened to the Google Glass? Google Glass. I have a hard time saying Google, Google, get over it. So uh, this week I'm just jumping in. Uh, I'm actually, I'm half asleep today. Some days, I think it's the weather. I think there is something that happens with the weather and uh, there's a different, maybe, maybe there's a different, um, maybe the air pressure, is it called the air pressure? Their barometric pressure, I believe I said that correctly affects me some way. I think it's changing temperatures. I don't know. But today, this morning, I, I felt like I had a, a cold, uh, a head cold. You know, when you, when you get a head cold and there's all this pressure on your forehead and stuff like that. Well, it felt like that this morning. And I, after having two pots of coffee, because that's what I do, uh, because I'm trying to just keep on moving because I've been very tired and I think it is the weather that's making me partially making me tired. I, w- I think I was deficient in something before, but I think it's the weather as well. Uh, I have been drinking a lot of coffee just to keep myself awake because it's just I feel a little sick. I feel tired. So we are actually going to be I'm a, this is a out of the blue podcast episode that I'm recording right now. I'm not doing as if I if I ramble a bit, it's because I didn't do as much planning but at the same time you're probably thinking hey he does, he rambles all the time anyway that's why i'm here i'm just seeing what happens but i i actually want to talk about video games and i want to talk about how video games can inform storytelling uh specifically because i think that i think people i think there are some people who are more and more understanding the value value of video games but I just want to talk about the different types of storytelling a little bit, and then I want to get into video games as well. And I want to I want to focus on one aspect of it, and we'll get it get to it later. But uh, throughout history, there's always been a form of storytelling, and this this newest video games storytelling in video games is the newest iteration of storytelling, if I can use that word that way. Video games and storytelling is the newest iteration. So we know well. I know that uh, oral histories, oral storytelling was the way people told stories first because we didn't always have written word. And since we didn't always have have the written word, the easiest way to tell a story without the written word is the spoken word. So that's where we start. And I think that um, for me, when I look at writing specifically, I think that when you tell a story, uh, you should go back to that oral tradition you are actually carrying on the oral tradition you might be thinking well how does this relate to to video games um well it is storytelling itself so everything is based off that oral tradition meaning that video games are hedged within that i think that um i think they do it in a different way they do it experientially but at the same time i think that that's where we go back to that's what it informs us if you want to think of it a different way And um, if you want to think of it a different way, if you have scientific paradigms, uh, for example, it at one point in history, somebody decided that and I think it was Aristotle. uh, Don't quote me on that, but I believe it was Aristotle. And he essentially made this assumption that you that the world actually exists and we can like study the world. Now, he didn't have the full picture. We don't have the full picture scientifically. 
there's a lot of stuff we don't know, tons of stuff we don't know, especially with the human body, the human brain, the human mind, outer space, etc. Uh, but there's tons of stuff we don't know. But at the same time, he's like, okay, we are going to make an assumption. Aristotle, I believe it was, who said this or who made this assumption that the real world actually exists. So we, when we make that assumption, if we make the assumption that the real world actually exists, then we are going to be looking at things differently and we are building our scientific tradition off that assumption, right? Can you prove that the real world actually exists? Some people may think that you can. Other people probably would disagree and say that you actually can't prove that anything outside of yourself exists. Um, and then you, you get into Descartes and stuff like that. And I think therefore I am in the same way, the oral tradition is that b base. I, I, even if things have changed a lot, even if we don't necessarily agree with how stories are told, even though we, uh, the details that were put into stories and how they were told in the different traditions back then and how people told stories, storytelling has that base. And I would say that in some way, if you ever study science, you realize that the history of science is not linear. It's not as if people are building one thing after the other. There are shifts in how people think. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's the case where somebody has an idea and that idea sticks around. But in in certain scientific fields, in certain scientific fields, there are paradigm shifts. Shifts. For example, I'm having trouble talking today. For example, uh, Isaac Newton had his, his new, Newtonian theory, and then and then uh, Albert Einstein is like, "Hey, we need to think about this differently." Now he didn't throw away Newton altogether, but he did shift the um, the idea of the physics, the idea of physics. Sorry. Uh, actually, the interesting thing about storytelling, when you look back at the oral tradition, is that I think storytelling is more similar. Uh, the basic parts of storytelling are more similar back then than um, it, they, they have a, uh, that base still exists and it still exists in more of a, a original form than it was with, than it is with different um, scientific things in the world or different thought patterns or different political ideas. Things in politics certainly have shifted uh, in terms of how people think you should do things. But storytelling really has kept very much the same in its core, which I think is a really cool thing. Uh, what was I going to say about it now? So if you look back at things like the Iliad, the Odyssey, if you look back at uh, Gilgamesh, you look back at all these really old stories, you look back at ancient texts that are stories, mythologies, you read those stories, you read those, those mythologies, and they do have things you would recognize in a regular, a newer story, not a regular story, just a newer story. Of course, um, so the oral, oral tradition shifted, and I think that the oral tradition probably shifted to the stage first. I think that there was probably drama. Uh, maybe there wasn't. Maybe th I think there was probably drama in some form, and maybe oral storytelling was a drama in some form. Um, before there was the written story okay I, I would I would bet that I don't have um, I don't have research right in front of me but it just makes logical sense to say okay people don't have written word but they're still acting out what happened and if you do tell a story if you if you are someone who is in a family or in a group of friends who uh, there's a tradition of, of oral storytelling it is almost certain that at some point in that oral in the oral storytelling of these people, that you're um, within, the group you're within, there's going to be someone who acts something out. Well, that's the beginning of drama. And then drama gets more complex, but this is rudimentary. And then I think it went to the written word. And the written word has been around for quite a long time. You look back to this, oh gosh, who are the first people? Um, cuneiform, and I can't remember who, I think it was the Assyrians, but I don't know off the top of my head. I should know this off the top of my head. But you look back at different different ancient peoples and they had writing and they and they told stories as well through those. And now uh, in the more modern era, in the past 100 years, even a little over 100 years in the past 150 years, let's just give it 150 years. So we have um, so we encapsulate all the things in this. In the past 150 years, we have radio, we have television and we have video games. Uh, I think radio is a really cool medium for telling stories i think that it it is something very different uh for telling stories for example you don't have to explain everything that's going on in a story you can rely on dialogue a lot more i actually think that things that are produced and put out on the radio that are are, are audio dramas if you've ever heard a real audio drama it's different than a 
audio book. If you've ever heard ever heard a real audio drama, it is a lot more satisfying than just listening to an audio book. What I put out for One Last Toast, check it out. Uh, what I put out is not an audio drama; it is an audio book. So I am read. I write stuff down and I read it as if I were just reading the book. And then for me, I add some stuff in there just to kind of bring you into the world. But at the same time, an audio drama is is as if you had nothing but the audio. You're not describing everything that's going on. It's relying more on dialogue. I think it, it provides a specific way of doing things that that um, that a audio book doesn't. And then we have television, which you could tell you actually when television first started, the movies specifically television is a little different because it's in your home but when the movies first started that's what i mean the screen uh you there were there were silent films so they got rid of they got rid of words almost altogether and they were telling stories almost purely through visuals and now we've get, gotten into video games video games are very unique um and there, it's hard to classify one type by itself. Now, there, are, for those of you who aren't familiar with them, or those of you who don't care, I'm going to there. I'm going to just explain some things to you. For those of you who, of you who know about them, then you are you might want to take a nap right now. That's all right. But when you think about video games, not every one of them tells a story. Possibly, okay. So when you think about video games, um, there are some of some video games or some so video games are digital games that are contained within some sort of electronic device. That could be a phone. I'm going to include those as well. That could be a television with a game console. That could be a computer, right? And that's pretty much it. Or or you could just you could have an arcade game of some sort too. But that's pretty much a video with a, a console or, or a computer in it or, or some sort some sort of thing like that. Some video games are abstract. Now, just because they're abstract doesn't mean they don't have a story, but some video games, as how I'm classifying them, are abstract. For it, for instance, Solitaire does not have a story. If you play Pong, Pong does not have a story. Uh, there are specific things you have to differentiate. There are specific, more com there are more complex games that I would not necessarily say have a story. There are certain games that are called uh, grand strategy games that have maybe the faintest glimmer of a story and and you uh, take on epochs and you're just moving pieces around and it's more like playing a board game so there are certain games that you take it and you put um, you put a board game inside of a computer and it's a very sophisticated board game right for those of you who know uh, video games is pretty easy to point some of these out one that is fairly one that is very, very popular, it's not around as much anymore, but it's still popular, is Age of Empires, right? That is a video game that doesn't have a story. I would say it doesn't have a story in how people usually play it. There are parts of it that do have a story, okay? But in how people usually play it, it is more like a board game. So I'm not specifically talking about those. Um, but at the same time, you can still have a very simple video game and you can still have a, you can still have a story within that really simple video game, extremely simple video game. Um, now, where was I going with this exactly? Now, now, I'm not going into the history of video games. I'm not going into how it changed or anything like that. I just want to point out what I have noticed in video games and how it tells a story differently than, uh, how it tells a story differently than in writing right i'm i'm directly comparing these to writing at the same time i think it is cool to look back that's kind of was why i was talking about the history i think it's cool to look back and see how things have changed and see how this also connects to those things as well um now when i look at a video game what the main purpose of a video game that has a story in it is for me um i think that that most people who make video or a lot of people who make video games actually get it wrong what they do is they try to force a story on the person playing the game they, they try to force a story on the person playing the game and they're trying to do something so in any type of video game there's a certain amount of uh there's a certain amount of abstract reasoning or or action that goes on in the video game that doesn't seem to relate to a story directly okay um now there are certain games that don't that that embrace this fully. There's there are other games that don't. Uh, if you pick up any random game and you play it, like you get what you need to play it, you go and play it. What's going to happen is you're going to have gameplay, you're going to have a cutscene, gameplay, a cutscene, gameplay, a cutscene, etc. 
But within, but that's not actually that. The part where you're playing is the game itself. The cutscene is a miniature movie that is strung together as you play the game. So I actually don't think that is telling a story with a video game. I think that's actually telling a story with a uh, computer animated movie. You just have a short computer animated movie. You have short computer animated clips and you go from one place to the other and you're collecting the movie and you're watching the movie and you get a story that way. And that had, that was the way, uh, that, that was the way a lot of games were made in the early 2000s. What they did is they had a short clip, you ran around, you got what you needed, you had another short clip and it told the story in that specific way. But I don't, that is not that is not actually telling a story through a video game, and that's not actually telling a story in the way that they can tell a story. I think that they, what they do, uh, what some people have done is they have gotten rid of the uh, the clips entirely. What what some video game, uh, what some game studios, that's what they're called, have done is they've gotten rid of these video clips entirely, and they've just replaced it with gameplay. And now, how do you do that? So I'm going to actually give you an example. One example that they've um, told the story with that I think is phenomenal because it it actually is different. It's not it's still not telling it through video games, but it's telling it within a video game itself, right? And this is where it gets really cool. There's uh, there's a game called Bioshock, it's, and it's a very very famous game. It came out in about two thousand. Oh gosh, I don't even know. Is it 2010? I don't even know what the date is that it came out. I don't have it on hand. It came out a few years back, like five to ten years back. Let's just give it a big, wide, uh, big, wide time period to exist in and become come into existence. But what they did for that storytelling, for the majority of it, is they had audio clips, and you'd essentially, as a character, you'd pick up the, these audio clips and you'd listen to these audio clips. It's a really good story. It's not necessarily telling in a way that it, it allows you to move around in the video game. It doesn't take you out of the world. That's the important part. That's the part I want to get to. But at the same time, this is still a an oral type of storytelling, right? Uh, you have people talking. It actually goes back to that oral tradition, which I think is really cool. There's another type of video game that uh, there's other games that instead of, I'm just going to say games from now on, unless I'm referring to a board game. There's other games that, that address it differently, and I think this is more satisfying. There's other games that just put you in a world. There's other games that just put you in a world and create things in the world that you can interact with. Now, there may be, there may be situations in that world where you need to read something. There may be situations in that world where you need to... Um, talk to someone but it all fits within that world uh bioshock the game i was just talking about does this they tell that story they they get around the game mechanics in a way i guess but at the same time they don't take you out of the world now in a lot of cases in these games that they don't explicitly state what's going on in these games where they just allow you to wander and figure out figure stuff out by yourself in these games a lot of times you're just left with a picture or a lot of times you're just left with pieces. Um, I think I think it's really cool. Uh, there's certain games that you run into. Maybe this isn't a specific game, but how it would work is you are. Let's just say the game focuses on a murder. Instead of having instead of having people explain to you what happened, instead of having people uh, say, "Oh, like this is where you should go," or "This is what you should do," or reading things people said, you actually see certain things in the world. So you're you're moving through this world. And you're experiencing this world. That's the really cool thing about it. And it allows you to go at a specific pace. It allows you to go at whatever pace you want as a person who's playing the game. And it opens up a different type of storytelling that is very experiential. Uh, that's different than other types of uh, media that we have right now. It's it's certainly different than oral storytelling. It's, it's different than all the types of um, word storytelling, if that makes sense. It's very visual. Think of it like this. Instead of just seeing things in a television, you get to actually move through through three-dimensional space within that television. And this is becoming, becoming even more immersive with the uh, virtual reality goggles that are uh, becoming cheaper. I don't know how good they are, but I, I'm assuming at some point they're going to get really good and it's going to be fairly uh, immersive because of those. At the same time, they're kind of putsy because you hold on to sticks and different things like that. But you're, you're probably wondering, 
as a writer, if you're a writer, or maybe even as a musician, and you're like thinking, well, how can I, how is this applicable to what I'm doing, right? You may say, well, I don't want to write a follow your own adventure book because follow your own adventure books uh, aren't, were never very fun to me. Follow your own adventure books were never very fun to me either. At the same time, uh, you can take specific things from what's going on in these games and you can apply them to your book. What's one thing that's really fascinating in games? Well, one thing that's really fascinating fascinating in games is the details people put in that they just let people um, either find by themselves or they take them out altogether. And there's specific details that people search out. This actually is something that um, I think happened, started with The Lord of the Rings. I think before The Lord of the Rings was written, people wrote fairly straightforward stories. And uh, even after Lord of the Rings was written, people wrote fairly short stories and they fairly straightforward stories and they had what you needed for the story. Well, what uh, Tolkien did with Lord of the Rings, and I think it was a paradigm shifter, uh, there may be some other stories that did this as well around that time, but I, th I think this was one of the big ones, if not the biggest one. What it is, it did it is, is it put all these details into the story. Now, some people find these details extremely boring. Some people find these details really interesting. So that they'll read all the little details in the book and they'll read all the appendices and they'll be like, wow, I didn't know that about the world, etc. What's happening in this book is world building. And this is something that happens. This is this is a common term. It's a it's a single term. This is a common term in video games is called world building and uh in writing too this has become this has come into this has come into the real world as well this is applicable to your own writing uh, even if you're writing something that isn't even if you're writing something that wants that you want to match that you want to match um reality as, as closely as possible right this is still applicable because when you're writing if you put in certain details, it's going to be more realistic. It's going to come across as more realistic. You're trying to get the nuance of something across. And I think that when you, that's the first thing. The world building part is the first thing that I want to get across with video games. One of the reasons why people like it so much is they can become immersed in this world. They can shut off the real world and they can jump into this world that they're playing in. But in writing, uh, you are directing everything they do, and you need to make it seem like they are diving into this world, and at the same time, you're trying to make this world different and extremely believable and very interesting. Uh, one thing I love about games is they, I think that some of the most innovative storytelling and the most the b most bizarre things are in these games. They, they will try a lot of different things. They will try stuff that... Um, they will try stuff that that writers don't come up with very often. Like I read books that are weird, but they're not as they're not they don't catch your brain. They don't they're not ideas that are unique. They're not ideas that pique your interest as much as a lot of these games. Uh, in a lot of these games, they have something you're like, ooh, I like that, right? And one of the reasons why they have it, and one of the reasons why people like it, is because they aren't told every little stinking detail of everything. Right. If you have um, if you create a world, if you're in the actual world, right, you might be somebody in a spaceship. Uh, if you're in the actual world, if you're in reality, there are a lot of things you don't actually know. And there's actually a lot of fascinating things in reality. You just have to act, try to look for them. You actually have to open your eyes. For example, if you're walking down the street and you look at the grass. You can't see everything about the grass. That grass keeps on going and going and going. You get a microscope. You can see um, you can see farther and farther farther down. Uh, at the same time, you don't get every part of the story when you talk to another person. There's a lot more nuance to the world than what you actually think there is, even if you think the world is nuanced. In the same way, uh, the video game developer it succeeds because they don't tell the whole stinking story. They don't tell every little tiny detail of every little thing that goes on in the story. You see something, you're like, huh, I wonder what that's about. There's a mystery to it. At the same time, you can draw people into your world by putting a little thing, a little something in the world that creates a little mystery. It could be very simple. It could be something that is... Um, it could be something that's bigger, right? For example, if you have characters talking, you could have a character say one thing uh, or another. You have them respond to something in a unique way. You don't have them. You do not have that character uh, 
You don't comment on what that character means exactly, and you don't have that character explain what they mean. Well, that creates a little bit of mystery in the story. That's a small way you could do it. Another way you could do it is if you just had something a character had. Uh, if uh, interesting characters or unique characters, characters that pique people's interests, are not, you don't explain everything about them. Uh, for example, if you look back to Clint Eastwood's Spaghetti Westerns, do are do you do you know everything about the characters Clint Eastwood plays in those westerns? Not often. It's not often the case that you do, if if at all. Uh, he is mysterious. Therefore, the character you create a backstory for the character, but at the same time, that character is very interesting because of the fact that you don't know everything. So when you write a story, uh, consider consider hiding things from the reader. Consider hiding things from the reader. And this goes back to a rule that I had that the, the reader's imagination needs to do something. That wasn't the specific name of the rule, but the reader actually has to engage with what's going on. And if the reader, if you tell everything to the reader, first of all, it's probably going to be boring if you explain every little detail. And second of all, uh, the reader isn't actually going to engage with the story. I think one of the reasons why readers can engage with some stories and not others the, the story specifically, not the writing. One of the reasons I think that readers can engage with um, certain stories and not others well is because the writer tells absolutely everything. The writer holds the hand of that reader. The writer thinks the reader is too stupid to make connections between two different things, or the writer's too stupid, uh, believes the reader is too stupid, or maybe, maybe makes the assumption, um, maybe doesn't even say it out loud, doesn't even think it, but maybe the writer approaches writing from, from this perspective of the reader being too stupid to actually make their own assumptions about certain things. So uh, I think that that actually handicaps the reading because if you read something and everything is told to you, uh, then you're like, well, this is this is more boring because I don't actually get to think about the things going on in the story. Let's take a look at, and by look, I mean just think about, let's take a look at classic novels. Well, with, uh, with more classic literature, literature that's said to have stood the test of time literature that that is said to be classic a classic work one of the great works in literature it's often the case that characters have hidden motivations it's often the case that characters you you don't get the whole explanation of who that character is right you do not get the whole explanation now you can still have a very rich thought life with your characters you can still have a very rich description of places with this method uh with, when you approach it from this this perspective instead of when you uh, when you uh, have characters think one suggestion that you could take on perhaps is that you don't have characters know absolutely everything one character one character i don't really like and i actually try to rebel against it in my own writing is the character that is the expert in everything they're the genius and they know everything that's going on that's one way I try to try to approach it. Another thing, another another experiment I've been trying to do in my own writing is writing from a flawed character perspective that's trying to be truthful. For example, if you are a storytelling and you're t storyteller, and you're trying to tell your story, you are not going to get every detail of your story correct. There's going to be certain things in your story that are going to be incorrect. There's going to be certain contradictions in your story. You're going to say things that don't make sense. You're going to say things that completely go against what you said before. Well, in the same way, if maybe perhaps one way you can approach it and one way I've been trying to approach some storytelling I'm doing is you take on the perspective of tr somebody trying to write their own story, uh, somebody looking back and trying to write their own story. That, if that makes sense. And what that does is uh, it automatically been, builds nuance and mystery into what you're trying to write. The final thing I think that uh, video games do a really good job on is allowing people to go through the content at their leisure. And this goes back to taking your time. This goes back to taking your time. Now, not everybody wants long descriptions of things. I think most people don't watch, want extremely long, in-depth, arduous descriptions of the world that they're reading about. But at the same time, I think people do want time taken to go through that world. Um, how can I explain this in a better way? This is somewhat related to um, me, my, my uh, it's related to me telling you as the listener that you should take your time and be patient when you're writing. Uh, what I said last week is that you have to earn dialogue, right? You start at one place in dialogue, you want to get to another part, take the time, earn that dialogue. Well, you're doing something similar to what the storyteller is doing in a video game. 
you are earning what's going on. In the video game, they create a big enough world or they create a world with enough stuff in it or they create a world that is uh, that you can re- interact with enough. In a story, you are actually going through the logical steps to get to your conclusion, right? Or you're taking extra time to get go through those logical steps to get to your conclusion. Um, we do not jump from we do not jump from uh, knowing nothing to being experts in something. In the same way, your character shouldn't jump from knowing nothing to being an expert. This is uh, this is again why people get angry at characters who have no flaws or characters who just seem to be able to do something out of the blue because you haven't earned what's going on with that character. The character has not earned the right to be able to do that. One re- one reason why um, Breaking Bad was such a satisfying show for those of you who enjoyed it was because they took a stinking long time to get to the end of that story. Uh, they took a stinking long time. They took their time taking this weakling. That's what that's what Walter White is in the story. He's pretty much a weakling at the beginning of the story. They take the time to shift that guy to an actual bad person. Uh, he gets corrupted slowly. He does worse and worse things. His character changes. They earn that character change. You need to earn that character change too. You need to earn your plot. You need to earn everything in your book. You're the one earning it, not the reader. The reader should just enjoy what's going on. You're the one who struggled hard to get that satisfying ending. You're the one who struggled hard to get that satisfying middle. You know, you're not just getting the satisfying ending. You're get the sa- getting the satisfying middle. So that's what I'm going to leave you with. There's no logical fallacy this week or anything like that. Just the two things: um, earn what you're writing, earn the ending, and at the same time, put nuance, put mystery, put something that people aren't going to figure out at the end of your book. It's just something that's in there. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to support me more. What I would ask you to do is that you go to iTunes and you leave a a five-star review. That is something that really, really helps me and helps push the podcast out to different people. And it's something that doesn't cost you much time at all. So if you would do that, I would really appreciate that. And I definitely appreciate everyone who listens to this podcast. If you ever listen to this podcast and you have questions or you have topics you would like me to cover... You can send those to me and I'll look them over and I'll, I'll see which ones I think I can cover in, intelligently. And if you just want to reach out for anything at all, you can do that as well. Uh, thanks for your time. My name is Daniel Poppy. And as always, this is How to Write Good. <laughs>